Hey guys, happy holidays to all of you who celebrate Christmas. My gift to you this year is this video, wait for it, with no sponsorships. And even better, we'll be walking through two problems that will help you determine if you're cut out to be a mechanical engineer and if mechanical engineering is something you're even interested in. The job of a mechanical engineer, in a nutshell, is to solve different types of problems, both big and small. So there are basically two different types of problems that you'll come across in academia and industry. The first type are open-ended questions and the second type are closed problems that have a clear set of solutions. Open-ended questions are generally more challenging, multifaceted in nature, more ambiguous, and more closely reflect real-world scenarios, like designing a 10% more fuel-efficient jet nozzle or optimizing the weight and cost of a smartphone. These problems often have multiple possible solutions, require creativity, and demand a deeper understanding of the bigger picture. Closed problems, on the other hand, have clear solutions with well-defined parameters. Think a physics or calculus problem. Open-ended problems often contain many closed problems whose solutions often guide our decisions and help refine the broader solution. For example, after solving the closed problem of material strength, the engineer can evaluate which materials are feasible and further iterate on a design. So let's look at this open-ended question first. We're tasked with designing the perfect travel mug that keeps your beverage hot or cold for as long as possible while remaining lightweight and easy to use. The focus here really isn't on aesthetics, but instead functionality, performance, manufacturability, and cost. The focus of this problem is also not really on solving equations or doing math, but of course you'll have to do that at some point. So as an engineer, the first step you have to do is fully understand what the problem is is before doing anything else. Well, we just said what the problem is. We have to design a travel mug that keeps your beverage hot or cold for as long as possible, that's lightweight and ergonomic. So the next step an engineer would do is ask the right questions and determine the constraints. What's the average temperature of a hot or cold beverage? How long should it stay hot or cold for? 10 minutes, an hour, 10 hours, or 20 hours? What environment would a mug be used in? Who's the customer? Are we designing this mug for hikers, office workers, students, or all of the above? What's considered lightweight? What's the average weight and volume of all the different mugs available on the market? How much do we plan to sell? What are the annual production volumes? What are specific features that make a travel mug ergonomic? A good engineer will ask the right questions at the right time. Next, the engineer will need to make assumptions based on data and a set of product requirements provided by product managers based on market needs and customer desires. So we can start to solve this problem by making a list of assumptions. Number one, most people drink chilled beverages between four to 10 degrees Celsius and hot beverages between 60 to 85 degrees Celsius. Number two, the mug should keep the beverage hot for at least 10 hours or the beverage cold for at least 18 hours. Number three, the materials used must be food grade. Number four, the target audience will be students and office workers. Number five, it should weigh a maximum of one pound and be able to hold 16 ounces of fluid. Number six, the annual production volumes will be half a million across all SKUs. Now the next step is actually applying the various mechanical engineering and physics principles and coming up with a design concept. To keep the beverage at the desired temperature, we would likely choose a vacuum insulated double walled stainless steel design. But how do we actually arrive at such a design? We know from heat transfer class that heat can transfer via three modes, conduction, convection, and or radiation. For a hot beverage, heat transfers from the fluid through the walls of the mug via conduction to the outer surface and into the surroundings. Heat is also lost from the surface of the beverage to the surrounding air if it's exposed to the air. Warm air above the beverage rises and is replaced 
replaced by the denser, cooler air. Finally, the hot liquid emits infrared radiation, transferring heat to the environment through space by electromagnetic waves, meaning it can travel through a vacuum without needing a medium to carry the heat, similar to how the sun warms the earth. So to prevent these three modes of heat transfer, we want to create a vacuum seal between two stainless steel walls to minimize heat loss via conduction. We then need to have a well-designed lid that prevents heat loss via convection. To prevent heat loss through radiation, we would need to apply some type of FDA approved food grade reflective coating that we could apply to the inner walls of the stainless steel mug. Obviously, as a mechanical engineer, you need to do a lot of initial design work, prototyping, simulations, detailed design work, testing, and perform various studies like design for manufacturability and assembly to determine what materials to use, how thick to make the walls, how big the gap of the vacuum should be, how to best design the sail on the lid, etc. Aside from performance, we also need to think about functionality and ergonomics. There's really no point in keeping the beverage hot or cold if the mug leaks or is difficult to pick up. Engineering isn't just about solving one problem. It's about balancing multiple requirements to come up with the best overall solution. Mechanical engineers often leverage pew charts to systematically compare different design options. So now we're deciding between a handful of design alternatives for this mug. The great thing about pew charts is that there's no limit. You can have two, six, or even a hundred design options to evaluate. Let's say we want to compare a vacuum insulated stainless steel design, a ceramic design, a plastic design, and a design with a handle versus no handle. We evaluate each design based on certain criteria like heat retention, weight, cost, durability, usability, and sustainability, scoring them to make the best choice. Each design gets assigned a score for each criterion based on how well it performs. A positive one means it's better than the baseline, a negative one means it's worse, and zero just means it's neutral. We then multiply these scores by the weight of each criterion and sum up all the rows. A weight of five for heat retention means we care about this criterion the most, and a weight of one for sustainability means it's nice to have, but we don't care about it too much. Based on our analysis, the vacuum insulated stainless steel and handle designs are the top performers for different reasons. Now, a great mechanical engineer doesn't just ask the right questions, make the right assumptions, or make data-driven decisions, or know how to apply engineering theory to solve problems. They need to be able to identify risks and shortcomings in their designs before the product actually goes to market. So for this travel mug problem or any system or process you want to de-risk and improve, we can leverage Ferrer Modes and Effects Analysis or FMEA to pinpoint and analyze all the potential Ferrer Modes. So some potential Ferrer Modes for a travel mug could be the lid leaking, the insulation failing, or the mug being too slippery to hold. By identifying and addressing risks early on, we can ensure a better, more reliable design and avoid product recalls that are extremely detrimental to a company and getting sued by customers in the event they get injured. So for each ferro mode, we start out by listing what actually causes the ferro mode and the effects of it. For example, the lid leaking is a ferro mode and the cause of it is a poor seal design. The effect of this ferro mode is spillage and burning the user. We assign scores on a scale of 1 to 10 for severity, occurrence, and detection, and then calculate a risk priority number or RPN by multiplying these three numbers together for each ferro mode. The higher the RPN, the more urgent it is to address the issue. For example, lid leakage is the highest priority because it has a severe effect, a high likelihood of occurrence, and a low likelihood of being detected before it reaches the end user. With this information, we can redesign the lid to have a more reliable seal, reducing the risk of leaks and improving the user experience. Of course, there's a lot more we have to consider if we're actually going to mass produce these travel mugs and sell them for a good profit margin and have a reasonable return on investment. Like if the annual production volume is half a million, that will dictate which manufacturing processes we can use. From that, we can further eliminate processes based on part 
geometry, material, cycle time, and cost. For example, it doesn't make sense to CNC machine travel mugs due to excess wasted material and long cycle times. Die casting probably doesn't make too much sense either because stainless steel has a high melting point and poor fluidity and molten form. Die casting is more commonly used for aluminum and zinc alloys that melt at lower temperatures and flow more easily into molds. That's why forming processes like deep drawing and spinning probably make the most sense. But I think you get the point that open-ended questions are more challenging, require creativity, critical thinking, keeping the big picture in mind, and making trade-offs. Now let's look at a clothes problem that has a clear-cut solution. So you're in a facility and a pipe carrying water at a pressure of two bar develops a pinhole leak. Water spraying out in a thin jet from the hole. What's the velocity of the water exiting the hole? Now, when you guys do close problems, I don't want you to think that it's all about solving equations and plugging in numbers. Try to actually understand how to apply the principles and formulas you learn to solve real world problems. So the first question we have to ask here is what causes the water to flow out of the pipe? The water inside the pipe we already know is at two bars. This pressure is exerted in all directions, including on the walls of the pipe and on any opening, such as the pinhole in the pipe. Outside the pipe, the pressure is typically the atmospheric pressure. This pressure is much lower than the pressure inside the pipe. So there's a pressure difference or gradient that creates a force which pushes the water out of the hole. The higher the pressure inside the pipe compared to the external pressure, the faster the water will be ejected from the hole. It's important to note that the water isn't being sucked out of the pipe. Rather, the pressure inside the pipe is pushing the water out to balance the pressures. Now we can apply Bernoulli's equation from fluid mechanics that relates pressure, velocity, and elevation at two points along a streamline and a steady flow for a fluid. Bernoulli's equation is actually based on the conservation of mechanical energy and fluid flow. So the total energy along a streamline is constant and the absence of friction. The fluid must also be incompressible, which water can be assumed to be. So if we set this location as 0.1 and this location as 0.2, then we can assume that the velocity of water in the pipe V1 is much smaller than the velocity at the hole V2. So this term becomes negligible. The heights at points 1 and 2 are the same, so the gravitational terms can be neglected. That leaves us with P1 equals P2 plus 1 half rho V2 squared. Rearranging this equation and plugging in the numbers, we know P2 is just atmospheric pressure or zero gauge pressure and water density is 1000 kilograms per meter cubed. So now we can solve for the velocity V2 and we get 20 meters per second as the final answer. So when you do these kinds of problems, don't just mindlessly plug and chug numbers. Try to really understand the applications of these equations and formulas. Bernoulli's equation can be applied to the design of aircraft wings, irrigation systems, HVAC systems, and a whole lot more. All right, guys, that's it for today. As always, thank you so much for watching. Hopefully these two problems were able to give you a better feel for the type of problems that mechanical engineers solve day to day. And I'll see you in the next one. Peace.